With the proper equipment and with the parade route set up, it's a cinch to kill the president. And they did it. There was a conspiracy. There was a plan to kill and murder our president, which they did. The ZR rifle program was an assassination program. has three great unsolved mysteries. The Cuban Missile Crisis, the unexplained reasons for Watergate, and the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Up to now, those three events have been thought of as separate. You're about to discover that they are tied together. They are the keys to understanding the conspiracy to assassinate John F. Kennedy. Live from our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., it's the JFK Conspiracy with your host, James Earl Jones. Hello, I'm James Earl Jones. Many mysteries surround the death of John F. Kennedy. Now, we're going to offer you brand new answers to the old questions. Who killed John F. Kennedy? Why did they do it? And how were they able to keep it covered up for all these years? You'll see who knew about it and how it began. That time I go to Ferry's house and Oswald's there and Shaw's there and Ferry's there and Cubans are there and all I hear is anti-Kennedy, anti-Castro, what are we going to do? And Ferry's walking back and forth. And then someone came up with an idea, what if you can't get Castro, you get Kennedy, and blame it on somebody that likes Castro and then the U.S. will go to war. Oh, it is. He said this would have to be done in a triangulation. He said the triangulation of cross -line. that was Ferry's idea. You'll see who carried it out. I have worked on presidential protection. I know there's more than one government. They know what they're doing. They have the right weapons. Everything is set up. It's, it's, a, it's a profession. You'll see who was behind it. It's not some external conspiracy that came from outside. This was something that happened at the heart of the deep American political system. And you'll see how it has been covered up for all these years. Well, there was a rash of deaths, many violent deaths. The deaths follow certain patterns. Plus, you'll see how it all connects to Watergate. Facts, photos, evidence never revealed anywhere before. Our guests on the show are people the public rarely gets to see. Agents of the CIA, the Pentagon, and the KGB, who deal in top secret operations. Investigators who are speaking to us despite a congressional gag order. Doctors with startling new medical evidence, witnesses and friends of Lee Harvey Oswald. What you see and hear may startle you, but it is all backed up with proof. Who killed Kennedy? Why did they do it? And who was the group behind it? But this information does not come without a price. People have died to get it out. Some of our guests are right now receiving death threats. But their goal, like ours, is to finally shed some light on a dark chapter of American history. Join us now for the JFK Conspiracy. The JFK Conspiracy. The truth has been hard to get in this case. For one thing, many government files have been sealed until the year... 2029. There are a number of bills to open the files currently being uh, considered in Congress, but some do not open all the files, particularly the intelligence files, and others insist on presidential review. As you view the show, you will understand the significance of these intelligence files. So now you have the opportunity to be heard on this important question. 
If you believe that all government agency files on the Kennedy assassination should be released with no further review, call 1-900-400-6341. To vote no, call 1-900-400-6351. Randomly connected callers may ask questions of our panel. Each call is $1, and you must be 18 or older to call. Kennedy was killed in a conspiracy. I think you'll soon see that. To help us understand the who and the why, with us are a former chief of covert operations for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colonel Fletcher Prouty, a high-ranking member of the KGB, Colonel Nietzsche Barenko, the highest-ranking CIA official to go public, Victor Marchetti, the man who put the Kennedy assassination back in the limelight, Oliver Stone, the forensic pathologist with startling new medical evidence, Dr. Cyril Wecht. Plus, witnesses, friends, investigators, military experts, and many others. But first, let's go back to that day in Dallas. The day was November 22nd, the time shortly before noon. It had rained earlier, but when John Kennedy arrived in Dallas, the sun was shining. As a result, the Secret Service left off the clear, bulletproof bubble top from the limousine. At first, the crowds were thick, but as the motorcade approached Dealey Plaza, people lining the route thinned to a trickle. And it was here that the motorcade violated the Secret Service's own rules. As the car turned, it slowed from 40 miles an hour to 7. It was precisely then that gunshots blasted out. For six seconds, the occupants of Kennedy's car were struck by bullets. Kennedy grasped for his throat. Connolly reacted as if he had been hit from behind. Kennedy's head exploded, driven with great force backwards and to the left. Then and only then did the president's car accelerate and speed off. Lyndon Johnson, the new president, ordered a federal commission to investigate the crime. Headed by Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren, it became known as the Warren Commission. Hundreds of witnesses, thousands of hours of testimony, and when they were done, the Warren Commission announced that three shots had been fired from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, from above and behind the president, by a single crazed gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald. The Warren Commission had given us the official version. Lee Harvey Oswald had acted alone. But if all three shots had come from behind, then why did the president's head fly backwards? A reaction more typical of being shot from the front. And why did so many people, including policemen, run not towards the book depository where Oswald was, but towards the picket fence? If the Warren Commission was right, why did so many witnesses claim to see something completely different from the official report? I believe with all of my heart that the shots came from behind the picket fence. And I focused in on a gentleman with a suit and a hat standing here at the picket fence. I saw a puff of smoke, then I saw a man with a rifle. I was shocked. It was a brown rifle. And I know enough about guns and hunting to know that he was shot from the front. I saw the man in the suit and the hat pitch the gun to the railroad man, and he walked off in this direction. Hundreds of witnesses, thousands of hours of testimony. Yet, these were eyewitnesses to the killing of the president, and the Warren Commission told us they didn't believe them. With us now is Gene Hill, who was closer to the president's car than anyone else at the time of the shooting. Ms. Hill is a Dallas grade school teacher and has feared for her life for the last 29 years. She's just written a book, JFK, The Last Dissenting Witness. And just last week, she received another death threat on the telephone. Ms. Hill, welcome. Thank you. What did the person, what did the person who threatened you on the phone say? Well, he said he thought that uh, I had learned my lesson and had learned to shut up, but that they'd found out that I had a book coming out and that if I said anything in the book, I would never live to enjoy it. Why were you in D.D. Plaza that day? Well, I went down there to take a picture of the president and also a good-looking motorcycle cop. 
just what, uh, um, what who you're doing uh, just before the shots rang out? Uh, looking for a good place to be seen and wearing a red raincoat where I could be seen. And just as my friend started to take a Polaroid picture of the president as his car was coming abreast, the shots rang out. I mean, I jumped on the street to yell at him to look this way, and shots rang out. He grabbed his throat, and that was the horrible headshot. How many shots did you hear? Four to six. Did you see a gunman? I saw smoke and a uh, puff of smoke and a flash of light from the knoll uh, where someone was shooting from behind the fence. I understand that two men claiming to be Secret Service agents interrogated you after the assassination. What were you asked? Well... They picked me up and took me to the courts building and uh, shoved me in a room where there were two other men, uh, assumed to be Secret Service also, and they asked me what I had seen. I told them uh, that I'd seen the president hit, that I saw a shooter from the knoll, and that I'd heard four to six shots. But they told me I didn't hear but three shots. Three bullets is all they had. Three shots is all they were willing to say right then. Well, did you go to Washington to speak to the Warren Commission? No, because uh, my boyfriend, who was a policeman, got word that uh, possibly I would be killed on that trip. And so I did not go, but not long after, the Warren Commission came to Dallas, and they came out after me and took me to Parkland Hospital. And I was the only non-medical person interviewed at Parkland Hospital. Were you ever in interviewed by the Warren Commission? Oh, yes. I was interviewed by uh, Arlen Specter, who, uh, who was very very uh well he tried very hard to discredit everything i said he uh, accused me of all kinds of things from like a shabby marital affair to seeking publicity to just downright lying well we have a we have a telephone call uh, the call is uh, from don s in atlanta georgia what is your question please my question is uh who do you believe that the, uh, the the Watergate burglars were acting in behalf of? That's for you, I think. Uh, why? I don't know. Watergate. Thank you. Next caller, Suzanne H., New York City. Uh, yes, my question is for Jean Hill. Jean, are you sorry that you spoke up? No, I'm, I've never been sorry that I spoke up. Uh, a little bit scared that I spoke up, but I wish I had told the truth then, but I don't think I'd be alive to tell the truth today had I spoke up so completely then. Later on in the show, Ms. Hill will tell us about one of the attempts on her life. As many as 177 people involved in this case have died suspiciously. Several Dallas policemen. We challenge the Warren Commission report. A lot of people who questioned the official report died suspiciously. You'll learn more about this later. But now, we thought we'd tell you about the man the Warren Commission said was the lone gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald. Dallas police suspected Oswald of two crimes. One was killing the president. The other was the murder of a Dallas policeman named J.D. Tippett, 45 minutes after Kennedy. It was a media frenzy. Within hours, we were told Oswald was a Marxist who handed out pro-Castro leaflets in New Orleans, that he was a communist who had defected to Russia, that he had renounced America and everything American, that he had married a Russian woman, and that he was a loner with a fascination for guns. This view of him was essential for the Warren Commission to explain his motives for assassinating the president. The facts that you people have been given, but I emphatically deny these charges. Yet we didn't believe him. Why? Because everything we were told about Oswald fit our profile of a murderer. What if Lee Harvey Oswald was really a U.S. intelligence agent? Joining us now is Victor Marchetti, former executive assistant to the... Deputy Director of the CIA under Richard Helms. 
Mr. Marchetti was at the CIA when Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, Mr. Marchetti, you, we know that Oswald lived in Russia. Was he a defector? It's possible, but more likely he was a, uh, uh, what we call a dangle. <clears throat> he was an American uh, intelligence agent who was put out there for the Soviets to recruit in the hope that he could penetrate their, uh, their intelligence service. Please explain what the Office of Naval Intelligence is. Now, the Office of Naval Intelligence is, a, is the Navy's uh, CIA, and that is uh, probably the outfit that uh, uh, Oswald was working for. Did Oswald ever work for the CIA? Not to my knowledge, and uh, although the CIA might have been aware of his operations, uh, the FBI would have been aware of the operations also, uh, particularly when he came back to this country. Well, did Oswald work for the FBI? No, I don't believe he did. I think he was uh, uh, working with naval intelligence, but the FBI was coordinating on the operation as was uh, the CIA in the, in the Soviet Union, of course, when he was there earlier. Thank you. Um, Oswald was a very mysterious person. To find out more about him, we have asked Ron Lewis, a friend of Oswald's, to join us. Oliver Stone, the director of the JFK movie, told us about Ron in his book, Flashback, The Untold Story of Lee Harvey Oswald. Marina Oswald confirmed to me that Ron Lewis did exist. And she remembered him because he bumped into her one day in New Orleans when she followed our uh, leader work. Mr. Lewis, I understand that you work with Oswald in New Orleans. We both work for Guy Bannister, but he didn't pay us. Uh, we got paid from another source. Who was Guy Bannister? He was uh, the head of uh, the Chicago office of the FBI. And uh, he also um, supplied guns for the Cuban refugees. And Lee told me this was a CIA operation. What did Oswald do for Guy Bannister? He went on to college campuses and he um, gathered information for the FBI. And uh, he also recruited people to work for Guy Bannister. Did Oswald ever handle gun shipments at uh, 544 Camp Street? He brought in a shipment of ammunition, and part of those were kept at 544 Camp Street. Part was taken in a laundry truck to Lake Poncer Train. I remember this because um, the uh, boxes were very heavy, and Lee was uh, not a muscular person, and he sometimes said he was going to quit because of it. Is it true that Oswald had worked with Jack Ruby in New Orleans? He told me that Jack Ruby drove the laundry truck. The Warren Commission said that Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby never knew each other. Are you saying that they did know each other? They knew each other very well. We know that, uh, okay. That makes us wonder how much else in the Warren Commission report regarding Oswald is incorrect. To prove that Oswald was a lone gunman, they had to fit him into a, an extremely tight schedule. So we went back to Dallas to, tra to trace the fateful three quarters of an hour from Kennedy's assassination to the murder of Officer Tippett. We began in the Texas School Book Depository. On the left, you see the time Oswald had to meet. On the right, you see a clock synchronized to the speed of the film. This is the time it actually took us. Ready. At 12.33, the Warren Commission said Oswald left the depository and walked seven blocks to catch a bus. They gave him three minutes. Three minutes, but it took us six and a half. Meanwhile, after traveling a couple of blocks, the bus was caught in an immense traffic jam. They said he got off the bus. At 12.48, they said Oswald climbed into a taxi. They gave him six minutes to reach his next stop. Over eight 
without traffic. The commission said Oswald entered his boarding house at one o'clock. At 103, his landlady said he left the house and went to the northbound bus stop. Yet in order to kill Officer Tippett, he had to travel south. So the commission said he must have changed his mind. The witnesses all said that Tippett was killed no later than 110. And that was after the policeman and his killer had a conversation. Seven minutes. Oswald simply didn't have enough time. In every case, the commission failed the time test. And we had no congested traffic to deal with. But Oswald never got his chance to tell his side of the story. Instead, in the most secure area of police headquarters, he was gunned down by a man named Jack Ruby. The murderer of President Kennedy was dead. And we were told the case was closed. But if the Warren Commission was wrong about the time schedule, perhaps they were also wrong in telling us he was a pro-communist in New Orleans. He comes to New Orleans. He comes in and joins a group which he's supposed to be a left-wing Marxist. He isn't. He's a right-wing fascist. This is the real Oswald. All we gotta do is get Kennedy in the open. Three tickets. We'll get him in a triangulation crossfire. <laughs> Blow away the president. <laughs> we'll use a, a diversionary shot. Someone we can sacrifice. And then we'll get him for real with the other two shots. David. We know people who can do it. You know we do. We'll kill and nobody will know did it. <laughs> if you believe that all government agency files on the Kennedy assassination should be released with no further review, call 1-900-400-6341. To vote no, call 1-900-400-6351. Randomly connected callers may ask questions of our panel. Each call is $1, and you must be 18 or older to call. Find out who conspired to kill the president next. Oswald spent a lot of time in New Orleans. The Warren Commission told us it was because he was pro-Castro, hell-bent on converting others to his Marxist ways. Oliver Stone's movie, JFK, deals with the New Orleans connection. See that? Now take a look here, 544 Camp Street, 531 Lafayette Street, same building, right? But with different addresses and different entrances, both going to the same place, to the office upstairs. Guess who used this address? The Harvey Oswald. The office belonged to Guy Bannister, formerly with the FBI. Not only was this address on Oswald's supposedly pro-Castro leaflets, but the account Oswald used to print the leaflets belonged to the CIA. In fact, everything about that address was connected to the CIA. It was a CIA operation where they had these the Cubans and they were training these people, and they, they had trucks going there with unloading rifles in there. Witnesses place Oswald there. They even heard him offer to train anti-Castro Cubans. I'll teach these guys drill warfare tactics. Yeah. But he wasn't the only one to share that office. E. Howard Hunt set up a CIA dummy organization called the Cuban Revolutionary Council. The headquarters for the Cuban Revolutionary Council were none other than 544 Camp Street in New Orleans. Howard Hunt with the CIA. Guy Bannister with the FBI and Lee Harvey Oswald, all in the same office. Today, there's evidence that Oswald only pretended to be pro-Castro. More likely, he was a U.S. intelligence agent on assignment. All of this, I believe, was part of the intelligence community's attempt uh, to both establish a left cover for Oswald, uh, to suggest that he was pro-Castro. He was not left-wing. I don't care what the Warren Commission said. It is dead wrong. 
Perry Russo was a college student in 1963 when he met the real Oswald, the right-wing intelligence community Oswald. What the hell's he doing here? What do you mean, what am I doing here? What the hell are you doing here? I gave him some expletives back, no, and, uh, and then Perry jumped in between us and said, oh, he's all right, he's a friend of mine. He was in the wrong house to be a left-wing Marxist because you're dealing with rabid right-wing fascists that were violent in their desire to overthrow uh, Fidel. Oswald had gone to the right-wing Cubans a few days before, I and mean, then he goes out in the street right in front and starts becoming a left-winger a couple of days later. So the right-wing Cubans go crazy. They attack Oswald, they attack him first, but he gets arrested. The moment he got to jail, an FBI agent named Regis Kennedy rushed down to see him. Regis Kennedy was an uh, FBI agent. Lee Harvey Oswald was an informer for Regis Kennedy. It was a source of information from him, for him. Now, Dave, Dave Ferry told investigators about the connection between Regis the FBI Kennedy. and Oswald. We received 19 files. Reference was made in those files to the Central Intelligence Agency contract number of Lee Harvey Oswald and the um, FBI informant number S172 of Oswald and the $200 a month stipend that he was receiving. Bannister connected to the FBI, Ferry with the CIA, Oswald with contract numbers at both, all together in an office shared by Howard Hunt of the CIA. But one other person was also there, a man named Clay Shaw. The only person ever to be charged in court with a conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy. A very different portrait of Oswald than that painted by the Warren Commission. Mr. Marchetti, who was Clay Shaw? Clay Shaw was a um, businessman who was involved in international commerce and uh, had quite a few connections overseas, uh, operating uh, uh, his, uh, his trademark there in New Orleans. How did you find out about Clay Shaw's connection to the uh, CIA? Well, uh, in, uh, at the time of the Garrison trial for Clay Shaw, I was working on the director of the CIA staff, and he had a morning meeting every day in which he had his 12 top lieutenants and a few staff officers. And one day he looked at the chief of the clandestine services and he said, are we giving uh, that guy all the help we can down there in New Orleans? And he was referring to Clay Shaw. And he said, because we don't want that, uh, words to the effect, we don't want that uh, crazy guy down there uh, causing any trouble. He was referring to uh, Jim Garrison. And I, I thought that was kind of surprising. After the meeting, I asked the director's assistant uh, why he, he brought this up. And I was told to be quiet. Uh, later in the day, the director's assistant came over to me and said, Look, uh, Clay Shaw used to work for us. He was a, c a contact of ours. And he uh, did a lot of things for us. And uh, this guy Garrison is digging into his background, and he may bring this out. It would be very embarrassing to the agency. And that's why uh, we want to help, uh, help Shaw. I see. Well, did Oswald ever work for Clay Shaw? Um, I think he uh, probably did, from uh, uh, everything I know, but I did not know uh, that in the agency. Uh, Ron Lewis, do you, do you know if he ever worked for Clay Shaw? Lee was paid to, um, <clears throat> by Clay Shaw to distribute leaflets in front of the uh, International Trade Mart, but uh, Lee told me this was just a front. Was Oswald involved in the plan to kill Kennedy? Yes, he was. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Later in the show, you'll actually hear from the KGB. Oswald's past was hidden all these years as part of a cover-up. The truth, had it been known, had it come out, would have revealed there was a conspiracy you people have been given, but I emphatically deny these charges. The conspiracy to kill the president needed a scapegoat, a patsy, someone who would take the blame. That's because there was a need for us to be directed away from the evidence, away from the fact that Kennedy was hit by three gunmen, 
firing from different positions. In a conspiracy, they would embroil the nation in a cover-up so great that 12 years later, it would lead to the Watergate break-in. Close. Negative, our men are dressed in business. Still to come, startling new medical evidence. They killed Kennedy and the cover-up that followed it. You must first take a step back into history to a man named Fidel Castro. In 1959, the Eisenhower administration got the shock of its life. Fidel Castro, a young freedom fighter that Washington had armed and supported, announced to the world that he was a communist. Eisenhower ordered the CIA to recruit Cuban refugees. Special military camps were set up around the country to equip and train this new force. It became known as Operation 40. But Castro continued to thumb his nose at Washington. So in June of 1960, as Castro invited Soviet advisors onto his soil, a new decision was made. Assassinate Castro. Joining us now to explain more of this history is the chief counsel for the Christic Institute, Daniel Sheehan. The Christic Institute is a non-profit public public interest law firm best known for winning the Karen Silkwood case. Mr. Sheehan, what group made the uh, decision to assassinate Castro? Well, we know, James, that uh, Richard Bissell was involved, who was the deputy director for plans and covert operations for the CIA. And we know that uh, J.C. King, who was the director of Western Hemisphere operations for the agency, was involved. And also Sheffield Edwards, the chief of security. But clearly, someone from the 5412 committee, the ultra-secret committee uh, to direct covert operations, had to have been involved in this decision at that high a level to carry out something so important. We understand that billionaire Howard Hughes helped to set up the ultra-black operation. What role did he play? Well, obviously, whoever this was on the 5412 committee uh, that made this decision to kill Castro had apparently contacted Howard Hughes to get him to help set up this operation for deniability. And that is the point through which a man by the name of Robert Mayhew got assigned through the Hughes organization to carry this operation out to set up a political assassination unit, an ultra-secret political assassination unit of some dozen Cubans to kill Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. Mr. McKetty, had the CIA worked with the Mafia before? Oh, certainly. The CIA got involved with the Mafia in, uh, in World War II when it was o uh, OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, in order to have the help of organized crime in their guerrilla activities in Sicily and Italy. And since then, the CIA has worked with uh, organized crime in uh, the Corsican Brotherhood in France, uh, in running dope from uh, the Middle East. They got involved with it in, the, uh, in Southeast Asia. And uh, uh, eventually they, uh, uh, they got involved with, with crime in, in, um, uh, in, in Latin America as well. And this brings them into, into Castro because they were working with organized crime, Meyer Lansky, and that part of the mafia in Cuba. I see. Uh, Mr. Sheehan, um, is the, if, the, if the mafia was involved, how the CIA con uh, keep control? Well, what happened, James, was that the, uh, the decision that Robert Mayhew uh, was involved with was directed by the 5412 committee to bring in the mob. He contacted uh, Johnny Roselli. Uh, out of, uh, out of Las, Las Vegas, and then Sam Giancana and Sam Gian Giancana contacted Santo Traficante. These guys all got involved in the way they had it handled. The way they had it handled was the CIA assigned specific people to supervise this assassination team. E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis very specifically were assigned to control the training and assignment of this, this extremely secret political assassination team that was set up in 1960. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's tell you more about the assassination team. Its name would change with every operation. Uh, for this program, we'll call it S-Force. With the help of organized crime figures and under the direction of the CIA, 15 professional assassins were recruited to form a special operations unit, an ultra-black assassination squad. Their job was political assassination. Their target, 
was Fidel Castro. It was a murder incorporated. And it was a secret no one wanted to reveal. In November 1960, Nixon lost the election. Kennedy, Senator Kennedy will be the next president of the United States. And John Kennedy was sworn in as president. So help me God. Kennedy was not told about the existence of escorts. This secret was kept from him by Alan Dulles, director of the CIA. However, Kennedy was briefed on the other aspects of Operation 40. You must never be lulled into believing that either power has yielded its ambition for world domination. Ambition In April 1961, he ordered thousands of Cuban refugees, trained and equipped by the CIA, to invade Cuba. This operation became known as the Bay of Pigs. It was really a good plan because early in the planning, they brought in Marines who were specifically trained for uh, over-the-beach operations. But it turned into a disaster when somebody in the chain of command double-crossed Kennedy and canceled the final bombing run. Kennedy did not order the planes to stand down, but he was blamed. John Kennedy was suddenly hated by the Cuban exiles and all those who supported them. We'll kill Kennedy, and nobody will know what did it. <laughs> because Cuba was protected by the Soviet Union, Kennedy had to placate Khrushchev. He promised he would cease all CIA-related operations. But he also tried to placate the Cuban exiles. So he changed his mind and continued operations against Cuba. Kennedy's actions led to the Cuban Missile Crisis, taking the world to the brink of nuclear war. In a minute, you see how it all led to Kennedy's assassination. Coming up, congressional investigator breaks the gag order. Khrushchev found out that Kennedy lied to him and had continued CIA operations against Cuba. What Kennedy did was simply rename Operation 40, Operation Mongoose. Mr. Sheehan, what did Khrushchev do when he found out that Kennedy, li Kennedy lied to him? Well, what he did was to agree to send uh, missiles to Cuba and to send some bombers into Cuba to start to fortify Cuba against what he expected was a future threatened invasion again of Cuba by Kennedy's uh, Cuban forces. Uh, and how close did we come to a nuclear war? Well, it, it was pretty extraordinary. What happened, obviously, is the United States uh, picked up the, the transport of these missiles on ships coming to Cuba and confronted Khrushchev. Kennedy confronted Khrushchev and told him that they were drawing a line in the ocean against, along a particular longitude. And if any of these missiles, new missiles, crossed this line, we would technically be in a state of war with the Soviet Union and the Joint Chiefs of Staff had voted that if the ships did cross that line that we should go to nuclear first strike to maintain our credibility. And they crossed and? Well, the, the fact is they did cross and the Joint Chiefs reconvened and voted to go to nuclear first strike and told Kennedy that he should strike right now. How did Kennedy react to the threat of nuclear war? Well, according to the people that were there with him is that he was stunned at that moment. He had come to that critical moment of history that everyone had feared and he was being told by his Joint Chiefs that he should strike out completely against the Soviet Union. He was in his rocking chair, and apparently a tear came to his eye, and he said, I, I simply will not be the one that does this. And he immediately ordered all U.S. nuclear forces to stand down. This moment was what we call, in kind of religious circles, a metanoia, a, a, almost a, an experience that transported Kennedy to a different level of insight into the problems that had been being created by this Cuban plan. Well, uh, did Khrushchev want, really want a uh, nuclear war? No, it, it appears, James, it, it's, the travesty would have been is that he had ordered the ships to stop, but they had, they had not gotten the communication or they had just gone across the line completely by mistake. So it would have been a horrible tragedy to have this thing happen that way. Kennedy had come face to face with nuclear annihilation. He didn't want that to happen again. So he assured Khrushchev and Castro that the U.S. would keep its hands off Cuba. He ordered the CIA to stop interfering with Cuba. When they refused, he sent in the FBI to shut down their training camps. They started dumping on Kennedy for shutting down, attacking these bases. 
and shutting them down and calling him a traitor. Kennedy continued to make enemies as he pulled back from world confrontation. He put in the hotline to Moscow. He signed the... ...of what Kennedy was going to do or what he had done. Kennedy was changing the status quo. The whispers started. From big business to the military. From disgruntled intelligence agents to anti-Castro Cubans and their right-wing supporters. I killed Castro! Kennedy had to go. Forget Castro. We'll kill Kennedy, that's who will kill Kennedy! The mechanism was already in place. Air Force was available for hire, waiting for its next political target. And they resolved at that point, then between May and June of 1963, that they were going to kill President Kennedy. And they were going to kill him either in Miami, because he was scheduled to come to Miami and have an open car parade there, or in Texas. And that was the decision that they made, to go forward and to kill him. If you believe that all government agency files on the Kennedy assassination should be released with no further review, call 1-900-400-6341. To vote no, call 1-900-400-6351. Randomly connected callers may ask questions of our panel. Each call is $1, and you must be 18 or older to call. Up next, the shocking proof that Kennedy was killed in a conspiracy. Proof never... In this segment, you will see the evidence that Kennedy was killed in a conspiracy using more than one gunman. Our first guest is Dr. Cyril Wecht, a world-renowned forensic pathologist. He has been the coroner for Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and past president for the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. He was, one, he was the, the first non-government pathologist to examine the medical evidence concerning President Kennedy's, Kennedy's assassination. Dr. Weck, how does the evidence prove that there was more than one gunman? First, Mr. Jones, we have to understand the predicament that the government found itself in. When they analyzed the alleged murder weapon, the Manlicher Carcano, non-automatic bolt-action weapon developed before World War II in Italy, they determined that it took 2.3 seconds from shot to shot without allowing time for repositioning, re-aiming at a moving target. Then when they examined the Zapruder film, frame by frame, they saw that John Connolly was completely non-reactive, 1.5 to 1.6 seconds after Kennedy had already been hit in the throat. And that is what gave birth to the single bullet theory, that one shot came through Kennedy's back, through his neck, then through Connolly's chest, through Connolly's wrist, and the Connolly's left thigh. And that is what permitted them to say that Oswald was a sole assassin. It, it, I'm yes. sorry. I was just going to say, if you look then, <clears throat> Mr. Jones, at a frame from the Zapruder film, I'll illustrate the point I just made. This is frame 230. And if you see right here, there is John Conley's hat. I'm going to clear that a moment so we can first see his face. You'll see that there is no reaction whatsoever. Now, look at the white Stetson hat he's holding in his right wrist. Look at Kennedy, of course, having been struck. 1.5 to 1.6 seconds have elapsed, and John Conley, according to the single bullet theory of the Warren Commission, has been shot through the chest, the right wrist has been fractured, the nerve that permits the thumb to hold things in apposition with the fingers has been severed, the bullet's gone into the thigh, and he sits there totally, totally Unreacting. No, you might have covered this, but why couldn't one bullet have hit Connolly and Kennedy? The bullet that was found on the stretcher at the hospital, the hero of the single bullet scenario, in its original weight was 161 grains. The bullet that was found weighed 158.6 grains, a loss of 1.5% of the original weight of the bullet. And yet, when you look at the x-rays of these two men, you see fragments of the bullet in four anatomic locations with a significant fragment having been removed from the governor's wrist and another piece to this day remaining in his left leg. 
If you put all these together, you clearly have in excess of 1.5% of the original weight. If you look at the bullet, <clears throat> Mr. Jones, you'll see this is Commission Exhibit 399, the stretcher bullet, the magic bullet, as the critics prefer to call it. This bullet is absolutely pristine. It's a 6.5 millimeter, fully copper jacketed, except at the base, lead core piece of military ammunition. The nose, the cone of the bullet, which allegedly destroyed four inches of the governor's right fifth rib and caused a comminuted or shattered fracture of the distal radius, a dense heavy bone in a man Conley, a little taller than you even, that this bullet, according to them, broke both those bones and yet emerged in this pristine condition, losing only 1.5% of its original weight. And that is why that one bullet could not have produced those wounds. The other reason, of course, is the trajectory. If you look at this trajectory of the model that is portrayed here, you see that under the Warren Commission scenario, the bullet had to have entered Kennedy's back. And by the way, they revised that wound. It was placed several inches higher than they did on the night of the autopsy. And then they say it went through his neck. And as it was going out to the left and downward and forward, it would have had to have stopped in midair, come back about 18 inches, and then gone into John Conley's right posterior axillary area, which is a fancy way for saying right behind the armpit. And then when it came out, it saw the wrist over here and it said, hey, let's get the wrist in too. It reached over, got his wrist, shot I showed you before, holding the white Stetson hat, and then it moved downward. Now the angle through Conley's chest was downward about 25 degrees. The angle from the chest to the thigh was downward at 45 degrees, and yet the angle through Kennedy was upward at about seven degrees. So we've got then a bullet which does incredible gyrations like a roller coaster at an amusement park, moving horizontally and vertically at different times depending on whatever you need of it. Thank you, Doctor. We performed a test to find out if it was possible to have a bullet come out as the Warren Commission said it did. Larry Howard, the director of the JFK Assassination Information Center in Dallas, an antique gun collector and expert marksman, performed this test. This is a 6.5 Italian Manlecker Carcano rifle. This rifle dates back to World War II. It's identical to the one found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Bud Depository that, and that was allegedly used by Lee Harvey Oswald. The ammunition I'm going to fire is the same lot number allegedly used by Oswald. I got the ammunition from an antique gun collector and checked it with the information in the Warren Commission volumes. The rifle is not a very reliable gun. Many times it will misfire. Now, if that happens, we're going to have to take a second shot. The target is a combination of ballistics, gel, and bones. The ballistic gel assimilates the same properties of skin, and Dr. Wack suggested we use cow bones because they are very close to the consistency of human bones. Here we go. The bullet I just fired is severely distorted. Now let's compare it to CE 399, which is in near pristine condition. Dr. Wett, let's talk about let's talk about medical evidence. Who performed the autopsy? This is incredible. To do an autopsy on the President of the United States, dead as a result of multiple gunshot wounds. They called in two naval pathologists from Bethesda Naval Center here in D.C. who had never done a gunshot wound case, who had never performed medical legal autopsies, who were not forensic pathologists. And there was a third guy called over from the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, and he was in a, a bad situation, an Army man in a naval setting, and he had limited experience himself. Instead of calling in top forensic pathologists, who had been known and utilized by the United States government going back to World War II and in many capacities subsequent thereto, 
they deliberately excluded those people because they all shared one common flaw. They were civilians and could not be ordered to do things. Doctor, before you go on, um, let's talk with Dr. Charles Crenshaw, one of the doctors in the operating room when Kennedy was brought in to Parkland Memorial Hospital. Dr. Crenshaw has written the book, JFK, Conspiracy of Silence, in which he reveals many secrets he kept for over 28 years. Dr. Crenshaw, the Warren Commission told us that Kennedy was shot with three bullets, all from the back. Do you, did you see evidence of anything different? Yes, <clears throat> I saw definite evidence. I saw evidence of two wounds that were, came from the front. The head wound was tangential in nature, but it was a large avulsed area in the right rear part of the head. There was loss of part of the parietal, temporal, and most of the occipital lobe of the right cerebral hemisphere with exposure of the cerebellum. It was about two and a half to two and three-fourths inches in diameter, more or less circular in, the, in place, and had the appearance of an exit wound. When I saw the autopsy photos, there was no damage or no wound in the right rear area shown in two photographs. Well, the autopsy picture, uh, the, in, in the picture, the, the, the throat shows a two-inch incision where a tracheotomy was performed. Uh, is that what you remember seeing? No. The, the second wound that I saw from the front was the anterior neck wound, which was three to six millimeters or less than a fourth inch in diameter. It was clearly demarcated, round, and relatively clean cut. When the endotracheal tube didn't work, Dr. Perry performed a tracheostomy through the entrance wound. The incision was sharp with smooth edges about one to one and a half inches long. I might add it was the same as when the tube was removed before he was put into the coffin. But the autopsy photograph showed a widely gaping wound with irregular edges about two and a half to three inches long. Doctor, why have you kept this information secret for so long? Well, there was an edict of, si <coughs> of silence uh, put out, but in deference to that physician, I believe it really meant that we in the room were not to use this intense personal experience for co commercial gain or um, a head start in opening a new practice. However, that fraternal doctrine was kept for many years. I am now 59 years old and have completed the development of my department using Parkland as a model and will continue only in a teaching and administrative capacity for the next few years. And lastly, I think I was naive. I always felt our country would provide the best possible post-mortem examination with the best physicians and their goal would have the best investigation for our fallen president. Thank you, Doctor. Would you please stay on the line with us? Now we uh, turn to our new medical evidence, Dr. Wecht. How did this new evidence come to your attention? Larry Howard, whom we saw a little bit ago, called me and told me that he had been looking at the photos of the president's head again, and something that had troubled him perhaps subliminally previously had come to the fore once again. And that was, Mr. Jones, a straight line with short hairs in the president's scalp. We're looking at the back of the president's head, and this is the nose up front. In other words, the president is lying supine on his back on the autopsy table. And this is taken before the autopsy began. So what we're looking at then must be, if the photo is real and original, must be an untouched anatomical <clears throat> graphic portrayal of the president's head pre-autopsy. What Larry noted is this straight line with short hairs. Short hairs, not the kind found in someone with a full head of hair, but the kind found at the base of the scalp, at the hairline, where one gets a haircut and where the hairs are trimmed. In other words, what we're looking at here is a portion of the scalp that has been reflected upward from the rear or occipital area that Dr. Crenshaw was referring to that has been now reflected back up thusly, giving us 
the picture of the straight line with short hairs that we see here. Well, okay. And what does that prove? What it proves is that this picture is very likely revised altered photo. It definitely proves in conjunction with the Zapruder film that shows the president being hurled violently backward and to the left at the moment of impact of the headshot and force equals one half mass times velocity squared that we know the mass of the bullet 161 grains traveling almost 2100 feet per second a tremendous impact and supposedly according to the Warren Commission he's being struck from the rear but his body moves backward and to the left when you take that and you correlate it with the description that Dr. Crenshaw and other doctors at Parkland Hospital and a nurse and a Secret Service agent and a funeral director all said about a gaping defect in the right rear of the skull. When you look at these photos and you look at work that other people have been doing, including a colleague of mine, Mr. Tom Wilson in Pittsburgh and so on, you come to the conclusion that we're dealing with a big defect in the right rear of the skull and the significance of that is that it was an exit wound, not an entrance wound. But there are other holes, too, in the head that I hope we'll have a chance maybe to talk about later. Thank you, Doctor. Evidence like this usually never gets to the public. People who find it are often warned to keep quiet or worse are killed, like the case of Dallas policeman Buddy Walters. He was called in to pick up a, an escaped convict at a motel. The court never even determined whether the gun uh, that shot him was the policeman's gun or the, uh, the escaped convict's gun. Coming up, secrets from the KGB, plus the connection of the Kennedy assassination to Watergate. You've seen the medical evidence that proves the fatal shot exited from the back. Before this program is over, to see other evidence and know how this conspiracy was carried out. But first, getting at the truth in this case has been a painstaking and dangerous occupation. As many as 177 people have died simply for knowing too much. The moment Kennedy was killed, a massive cover-up went into operation. Witnesses were threatened and many were killed. Evidence was tampered with and destroyed, and documents were locked away under the guise of national security. There were many things you weren't supposed to see, like the paraffin test given to Oswald. It proved conclusively that Oswald had not fired a rifle that day, or the spy camera found in Oswald's possessions, issued to him by the U.S. government, or Oswald's letter to a Mr. Hunt requesting his next assignment. The only Hunt we know of in this case is Howard Hunt of the CIA, who shared the same office with Oswald in New Orleans. There were intelligence connections to Oswald everywhere you looked, and every one of them was covered up. There was even advance warning of the assassination received by the FBI that was locked away so you would never know. Roadblocks, cover up, hiding the truth. Jim Garrison, district attorney in New Orleans, learned that the hard way. I think he proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that Oswald, who was supposed to be a lone nut communist, had a very strange set of friends in uh, uh, New Orleans, among them uh, Clay, uh, David Ferry, Guy Bannister, and Clay Shaw. Garrison learned about Oswald's connections to New Orleans. He learned about the party in the summer of 1963. We'll kill Kennedy. He got Ferry to talk, and Ferry started telling him amazing details of the assassination. We gotta do. The word of Ferry's cooperation leaked out. And I got a phone call here in, here in my home when I, from, from Dave Ferry. He was panicking and he was almost crying. That's when the investigation leaked out. It was in a news meeting about the major investigation of the JFK. Uh, uh, and he was, like I say, panicking and they're screaming at the, they're going to kill me. You know, why did you do this? You know, what happened? Ferry was Garrison's major link to the truth. Through him, Garrison would have proved Kennedy was killed in a conspiracy. It is said Ferry wrote two suicide notes, both type and neither signed. It is said he died of a massive brain hemorrhage. But many people now believe Ferry was murdered. 
Without Ferry, Garrison was forced to find other witnesses. He learned of a Dallas policeman named Buddy Walters. Walters had been in Dealey Plaza when he found what appeared to be a fourth bullet. Walters originally described it as a 45 slug and then later uh, changed and said that he hadn't find a, found a bullet there. But there's photographic evidence from one of the Dallas newspaper photographers. Walters agreed to come to New Orleans and testify for Garrison. That's right. Police! I hear they got But bars. before he could leave, he was sent to a motel in Dallas. Come on, we come in! I'll tell our friend in there that he's got company. All right. Hey, pal. Hey, pal. So before he got to New Orleans, Buddy was killed. Garrison found another Dallas policeman, Officer Roger Craig. Uh, Craig and another uh, policeman found the rifle. Uh, Craig and, and, uh, and others were the first to see the, the spent shells near the window lined up in, uh, in, in a direct row about two inches apart. Not the way shells fall when they're ejected uh, randomly from a gun, um, but placed there. Craig also saw a man who he later said looked like Oswald running from the school book depository. When he reported this, he was told to say it didn't happen. Hold your horses. But Craig persisted. He too agreed to help Garrison. Craig survived, but someone was certainly trying to keep him silent. Three more violent attempts were made on Craig's life. He kept surviving. Finally, we are told, he committed suicide. Yet Garrison was determined to find the truth. He found a new witness, Perry Russo. Right away, I penned a letter to the DA's office in New Orleans. Because of Russo, Garrison brought charges against the only other person at the party, a wealthy industrialist named Clay Shaw. He felt he could prove Shaw was tied to the Kennedy assassination, but he needed federal cooperation. We got no cooperation from the federal government at all. At all. None. Zero. It was even an attempt to threaten his key witness. He said, you never knew anyone named Lee Oswald or Leon Oswald. You never heard anybody discuss shooting the president of the United States before the president was shot. And he says, and um, uh, you did not attend any party or meeting or gathering on Louisiana Avenue Parkway that the uh, uh, discussion uh, centered around shooting President Kennedy. We know people who can do it. You know, it, you never heard anybody... When he didn't go along, Russo was taken States. down. Garrison was taken down as well. As soon as Shaw was acquitted, powerful forces conspired to destroy Garrison's credibility. These forces are still at work. So believes Oliver Stone. They went after the movie with a, I think, uh, deliberately, early. I've never seen a movie that was attacked before it was released. This was a vicious attack, and it came in the form of Washington Post, a big article discrediting the movie based on a stolen script uh, that was sent to every news organization in America. I think we were everywhere. Next, an investigator from the House Select Committee on Assassinations breaks the gag order. Joining me now is a former investigator for the House Select Committee on Assassinations, Gaten Fonzi. Mr. Fonzi, did you sign the secrecy agreement? Yes, we had to. Uh, tell us about that agreement. The agreement was basically to prevent the press and the public knowing what the committee was doing as it was doing it. Well, why didn't, um, why didn't other members of the staff uh, speak up? Now? Well, it was the same way as it was with the Warren Commission. There were a lot of young ambitious attorneys on the committee who uh, saw the opportunity to use their work with the committee to enhance their resumes in the future. They were very interested in keeping uh, their government jobs, as it were. Why did you come forward? Well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I didn't give a damn about a government job. And secondly, I was outraged after the House Select Committee report came out that it was being treated as if it was uh, the final word. 
And uh, like the Warren Commission report, it was not at all uh, the result of a full and complete investigation. You found the first evidence that indicated Oswald was connected to the CIA. How did you make that link? I uh, came across a witness in Miami who was the leader of Alpha 66, one of the most violent and aggressive anti-Castro Cuban groups. It was the, the group, in fact, that attempted to embarrass Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis when he was in delicate negotiations with Khrushchev. Uh, his name was, the leader of this group was named Al, uh, Antonio Visciana. Visciana told me that throughout the period that he formed the group, prior to forming the group, and throughout the period of 19, from 1961 to 1973, he was directed by an American who was a strategic director of Alpha 66, the secret behind the scenes man. And in September of 1963, he used to meet with uh, Bishop on, at various times and in various places. In September of 1963, he met with Bishop in uh, a man named Maurice Bishop was this fellow's name. He met with Bishop in Dallas and he saw Bishop talking to a young man whom he later identified as Lee Harvey Oswald. Visiana how, did. How did you identify Maurice Bishop? We had a sketch drawn from Visiana's description. At the time, I was working for Senator Schweiker, who was on the uh, Church Intelligence Committee. He had set up a Kennedy subcommittee on the assassination. And Senator Schweiker recognized the sketch as one of the CIA off officials who had testified before the Church Committee. How do you feel the committee followed up its leads? It didn't. It didn't uh, follow up uh, the leads, especially in relation to the CIA. In the turn, in case of the Maurice Bishop incident, it uh, did nothing at all to uh, confirm the fact that David Atlee Phillips was, in fact, Maurice Bishop. Well, as you said, it seems that the House Select Committee failed to follow up on its most promising, and obviously, the CIA. But they did make a, an important contribution. They concluded that Kennedy had been killed by at least two gunmen as part of a conspiracy. And they brought the CIA mafia assassination plots out into the open. But five years earlier, no one knew these plots existed. It is the secret that ties the Kennedy assassination to Watergate. Next, the connection of the Kennedy assassination to Watergate. There was a conspiracy to kill JFK. The U.S. Congress knew that in 1978, when the acoustical evidence proved it to them. But several people knew, or suspected it, years earlier. Lyndon Johnson and Earl Warren realized there was a conspiracy to kill Kennedy. I'm positive that Lyndon Johnson, during that week after Kennedy's death, realized how close those bullets came to him and what they meant. Johnson was only two cars behind Kennedy. And Colonel Prouty believes that fear is one of the reasons that Johnson and Warren, even J. Edgar Hoover, went along with the cover-up. I think all those men recognized right then that the power of the bullets was very strong. The truth frightened them too much to let it be revealed. Nixon was in Dallas at the moment the president was killed. He was there on business, nothing to do with the assassination. But years earlier, he had been vice president when Air Force was created. He may very well have realized that the group had been involved in the Kennedy assassination. In 1968, Nixon became president. In 1972, one of the most baffling mysteries in America began. Watergate. It was a midnight break-in to an office building in Washington. People still don't understand what the connection between that Watergate burglary was and the assassination of President Kennedy. Five men broke into Democratic National Headquarters. Why? Possibly because the new chairman, Larry O'Brien, might have gotten hold of documents pertaining to S Force. These were no second rate burglars. Most of them had been involved in the early days of S Force. E. Howard Hunt, Frank Sturgis, Bernard Barker, Virgil Gonzalez, and Eugenio Rolando Martinez. These were high level intelligence agents. 
who went into Watergate. They needed to get into Larry O'Brien's safe. They knew what to look for. The security officer called the police, but the lookout for the burglars didn't realize that the three hippies he saw were actually undercover cops. We're going up. Before they were successful, they were caught. Move it, move it. And their capture led to the first resignation of an American president. Mr. Sheehan, who were the actual burglars? The actual burglars, Rolando Martinez and Virgilio Gonzalez and Bernard Barker and the others, many of them were actual members of the ultra-secret S-Force, the political assassination group that had been set up back in 1960 when Richard Nixon had been vice president. And when Mr. Bissell and the others in the CIA had set up this ultra-secret group to assassinate Fidel Castro with the help of Howard Hughes and his lawyer, uh, Robert Mayhew. Was Nixon one of the conspirators to kill Kennedy? No, it doesn't appear that that's true. It appears that what he did is he suspected that this group that was this special group designed to assassinate heads of state may well have done this. And since he had been vice president, when the group had been set up and the head of the 5412 committee, that it could lead back to him and generate a very bad image. Mr. Marchetti, what can we learn from the Watergate experience? Well, we can learn that uh, you have to have much more tighter control over secret operations. The uh, CIA cannot be the secret tool of the President of the United States. There has to be uh, oversight, and not just from Congress, but uh, from uh, the American public. Mr. Uh, Mr. Sheehan, everybody wants to know, who is Deep Throat? Well, many, many people in, in a number of books, the, the uh, secret coup and others have suggested that it was General Haig, Alexander Haig, but it was only in part Haig. He supplied a few documents, as did Admiral Bobby Ray Inman, but the key, the guy to, to Deep Throat, was Robert Bennett, who was Robert Mayhew's assistant. Remember, Mayhew was the man with Howard Hughes who had set up the political assassination group back in 1960, working with the CIA and organized crime, that Robert Bennett is the man who delivered the documents to uh, Bob Woodward. Well, Daniel Sheehan isn't the only person who's told us that Nixon's downfall was orchestrated. At first, the Watergate break-in posed no threat to Nixon, but that all changed. Nixon was building his own private intelligence agency, and I think this is why the other agencies, CIA and the FBI and maybe even the Pentagon, collaborated to bring Nixon down. Nixon threatened the CIA. Nixon fired the CIA director. Nixon threatened the status quo. Nixon had to go. Exactly nine years earlier, Kennedy had followed the same course. Kennedy had threatened the CIA. Kennedy had fired the CIA director. Kennedy had threatened the status quo. Except then, they used the assassination squad. Next, the group behind the conspiracy to assassinate JFK doubt that John Kennedy was killed in a conspiracy. But two questions remain. The first is, what really happened that day in Dallas? Forget Castro. We'll kill Kennedy. That's who will kill Kennedy. You ain't never going to get that shit. Yeah, you sure we will. We'll, we'll kill Kennedy and blame it on Castro. The whole country will want to invade Cuba. David. All we gotta do is get Kennedy in the open. And then three teams will get him in a triangulation, a crossfire. <laughs> David, we know people who can do it. You know what do. Because of his ties to the CIA and the Mafia, Ferry probably did know of the conspiracy that was taking shape. Although it is doubtful that he knew precisely about S-Force. 
The ZR Rifle Program was an assassination program. The ZR Rifle Program had been involved in, in assassinating Patrice Lumumba, that assassinated Trujillo. That's the machinery, Murder Incorporated. That's the people. In fact, they call them mechanics. You see a man on the phone that simply says where, and they say uh, in the south, and when, in the fall, and uh, all right, thank you. And, uh, and on November 22nd, it was to be for them just another assignment. It had rained earlier that day, but by noon, it had stopped. You're dealing with people who are trained to do this in the first place. They don't need bonuses and pay. They have access, they are assured they can leave. for equipment and with access to the place and with the parade route set up to come right by where they are at a very slow pace it's a cinch to kill the president and they did kennedy's motorcade was arranged to make two turns taking him directly into a triangulation the first shot came from the picket fence it hit kennedy in the throat the second shot came from the dow text building next to the book depository it entered Kennedy's back. The third shot came from the southwest corner of the book depository, seventh floor. It hit Conley. The fourth shot came from the Daltex. It narrowly missed, hit the curb, wounding a bystander. The fifth and sixth shots were fired almost simultaneously from the depository and from the picket fence. Both hit Kennedy in the head. One from above, moving him forward. Then an instant later, one from the front, tossing him back. One from above, moving him forward. Then an instant later, one from the front, tossing him back. Now, only one question remains. Who ordered it? Our experts believe those orders came not from Lyndon Johnson, not from J. Edgar Hoover, not from the CIA as an agency, or even the Pentagon, but from a group of individuals, a power elite. These people knew how to turn on S-Force. They knew how to turn S-Force against their own president. Look what's happened here. This group of guys that we have developed over these years in this ultra-secret program to kill Castro has killed the president because he betrayed them. The story of the Kennedy assassination and the story of other scandals that we've had in our government are a kind of karma coming home, a kind of retribution for what we did to other governments. This is Lyndon Johnson talking, the President of the United States. He said, we operate a murder incorporated. Johnson said we operate it. He didn't say we used to operate it. He said we operate it. Now, for President Johnson to say that there was a murder incorporated invo involved in the death of Kennedy, you can be sure he was not talking about Lee Harvey Oswald. He knew what he was talking about. And that's how Kennedy was killed. We have discovered that hiring assassins is an established procedure, a way of doing business, and that we're not the only country to do it. But in our case, this procedure was turned against our own president. This special operations unit, this group we have referred to in this program as 
S Force. It is their very ex existence that is the key to the conspiracy to assassinate JFK. Mr. Sheehan, what can be done to stop S Force? Well, one of the things, James, that we have to do is to have a thorough investigation of the setting up of this group, who was in it, and what crimes they've committed, and hold them responsible for it. And there needs to be a thorough investigation by a special prosecutor to investigate their connection to the assassination of President Kennedy and, of course, to the Watergate burglary to show that it was their connection to this group and Howard Hughes that was being looked for. Uh, Mr. Marchetti, how do we harness the illegal covert operations of the CIA? Well, supposedly by law, mainly through Congress. But right now there are two bills before Congress that are designed to revise the intelligence system and they allow for the same things to continue on. The president is still allowed to have the right to, and the sole discretion to car carry out covered action without oversight. We have a telephone question. The caller is Debbie from Clearwater. Good evening. Um, I recall when the assassination took place that there, it was announced that the files or the information about the um, assassination would not be um, released. Why did the people of our country tolerate that and the secrecy of the files and the information regarding the assassination at that time? Well, the problem is that most of the American people don't feel that we have anything to do with the decisions that are made by our government. Most people just come once every four years and vote for a president that's offered to us by the Republican or Democratic Party, neither one of whom we're particularly pleased by, the people have to learn to take control. And that's why they can call in and demand that these files be reopened, that a special prosecutor be assigned to investigate the existence of this political assassination group that was established back in 1960, back when the president and vice president authorized political assassinations. This has to be looked into. It has to be brought to light. The American people have to take charge of our government. That's why they allow things like this to go on. The time is over to let this stuff go on any longer. We'll take another call. It's Rick from Rockwell. Your question, Rockwood? please. Hello? Yes, Rick. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to know why it's taken uh, so long for this information and the truth uh, to be exposed. Well, the first place, <laughs> it hasn't been exposed yet, and I don't think it ever will be. Secrecy in government is designed for one purpose and one purpose only. Not to keep the enemy or the opposition from knowing what's going on, but to keep the American people from knowing what is going on. And all the evidence that exists, that, or might have existed, that would implicate uh, the government in Kennedy's assassination, you can be sure that evidence is now destroyed. So even if everything is released now, the chances of solving the Kennedy assassination and uh, attaching the blame to the guilty parties is almost impossible. All through this program, we've been offering you an opportunity to vote on the question, should all the government files be released with no further review? We thought you'd like to know the results of your votes. Uh, we'll do that in a few minutes. Still to come, secrets from the KGB. All through this show, you've heard about a conspiracy. You've heard people say that Lee Harvey Oswald was set up as the fall guy. Wouldn't you like to know what the KGB says about Oswald? Meet a high-ranking secret agent from the KGB, a man never before seen on television, Colonel Ole. No, I'm going to pass on that one, <laughs> his name. Uh, in 1963, he was uh, an officer in the counterintelligence in Mexico and met with Oswald at the Russian embassy two months before the assassination. When I met uh, Oswald in uh, Mexico City in 1963, the discussion was about the um, visa for Russia. Oswald's emotional, st emotional state was uh, very agitated, very tense, and uh, very nervous. I spoke uh, with Oswald during um, our conversation 
And the second visit, I consider that he was in, in, in big trouble. In, in something was uh, very dangerous for him. I consider that Jim Garrison investigation is very important because uh, its investigation is directed in, in uh, New Orleans uh, activities of Oswald. And my personal opinion that this is a very, a very important place where maybe it's necessary to repeat the investigation. I consider that uh, was conspiracy, uh, which uh, involved more than only Lee Harvey Oswald. And that was Colonel Nichiporenko. We know that the Colonel has additional information about the Kennedy assassination, but due to his highly sensitive nature, this is all we can share at this time. We began this show nearly two hours ago, and uh, the response to our telephone question, no, hold on, please. There was something that came up earlier. Earlier, uh, Mr. Lewis, you said that Oswald was involved in the plot to kill Kennedy. Was Oswald supposed to kill Kennedy? He knew there was a plot to kill Kennedy, but he didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, but eventually he became involved with them. Well, who was supposed to kill Kennedy? Um, he told me that um, Roscoe White was supposed to kill Kennedy. He was to be one of the trigger men. Thank you, sir. I was going to say we began this show two hours ago uh, in response to our television uh, our, our telephone uh, question has been overwhelming. 99% want the files open, 1% to keep them closed. Before we say goodbye, we have one more phone number to tell you about. This time, you won't simply be voting. You'll be leaving your name, address, and phone number, which will be forwarded directly to your congressman. The impact can be enormous, and it is cheaper and far easier than sending a telegram. To contact your congressman and tell them that you want all files released, call 1-900-288-5JFK. You will be asked for your name, address, and phone number. Calls cost $1 a minute and will take an average of two minutes. Callers must be 18 or older. This number will be available until further notice. I want to thank all of our guests and everybody helping to put this uh, story together. Was Kennedy a great president or even a good one? That is for history to determine. But his death leaves us with a dilemma. Do we as a nation want to deal with paid assassins? Today, they might work for us, but tomorrow, how can we know? We've been asked, what is the purpose of opening old wounds? Well, perhaps the answer is for our children. We teach them to tell the truth, to speak up when there is a wrong. But in this case, those who tried to speak up were silenced, and that is wrong. Perhaps by opening the files, all the files, we can clean the slate and start again. We can only hope. Goodbye. Order your limited edition copy of the JFK Conspiracy with the complete Zapruder film and more of our exclusive interview with Oliver Stone. Call 1-800-776-2800. Accommodations provided by the Deluxe Phoenix Park Hotel, the center of Gaelic hospitality in America on Washington's Capitol Hill.
transportation in Washington, D.C., provided by Dollar Rent-A-Car.